So, hello. Um, this video is going to just demonstrate a couple other techniques uh, that are handy with scatter plots and also illustrate a couple opportunities and how fast it is uh, to identify this stuff once you've got one of these uh, set up. And I'm actually, you know, I'm working with the data uh, from uh, the previous post where it was, uh, you know, a facility where we had that simultaneous heating and cooling issue that showed up. Um, you probably remember, you know, the these uh, scatter plots where I had the gas and the electric cloud and realized we were running the chiller at temperatures that it didn't make sense, probably, and then also that um, the reheat load was actually associated with the uh, empty meeting room was probably what um, was kicking the gas consumption up so high in the warm weather, or one, at least one of the contributors. Um, and actually in the next blog post, I'll show you the results. Um, Brian and Jay actually made some changes to capture the savings, and they were there, and they were significant, and they were easy to capture, actually. But what I want to focus in on this post is a couple things that we, um, a couple other things we notice, and a couple sort of techniques we use to notice them. Um, and basically I'm going to illustrate this with the electric data and play with the filters. And, and one of the things that's kind of handy when you're starting to play with the filters is to not have to jump back and forth between the tab, the page with the filters, you know, and the page with the chart. And so a lot of times, even though I like having the chart sort of this size because it's easier to read and, you know, makes, uh, you know, a more legible chart to insert in a presentation, a lot of times if I'm going to play around with the filters, I'll actually stick a copy of the chart in the spreadsheet right above the columns with the filters in it, so, I, so it's pretty accessible that way. And so basically I just need to make a hole for that to happen in, and so I'm going to maybe insert 20 rows. I've just highlighted you know, a bunch of rows. I'm going to, over here in the border, I'm going to right click and I'm going to say insert. Um, oh, there's a pivot table out there. I can't do that, so I'll have to do it a fewer, a couple less rows at a time. So I'm going to do it this way, insert. And uh, just, I want to get about 20 rows in there. Just give me a big enough space for a legible chart. So, It'll probably work. <coughs> so now, excuse me, I'm going to go back to that chart, and I want to grab the KW versus outside air temperature one. So I'm going to click on it, and I'm going to copy it. And I can say copy. I can do Control V. Any of the approaches you for copy. I'm going to go back to here, and I'm just going to tab over. So I'm sort of more over the places where I'm going to do the filtering. And I'm going to paste it in. So I'm going to say um, paste. Oops. And I actually want the chart. I don't want a bitmap of the chart. And then I'm just going to drag that a little bit to get it so it's sized, you know, in a, at a meaningful size, you know. I'm also worried about it being legible. I just want to be able to see the shapes of the clouds vary as I apply some of these filters. And so now I've got, got that chart in there. Um, and so one of the things that we got to thinking about as we were looking at this is we thought, well, if this is probably the chiller and if this is the base load, then this should represent the air handling equipment and things like that running in a normal cycle. And so if that's all true, if I filter out the normal operating hours and days for this, I should be able to make most of this cloud go away. In other words, if I th this building was scheduled to run Monday through Friday from about 7 in the morning to about 5 in the evening. Um, that was a pretty fixed schedule. So if I basically hide all those hours, I say don't pay attention to those hours with this spreadsheet, with these filters, and if all those hours are what cause those dots to appear, then all those dots should go away when I make this filter. And it turned out, I'm just going to do that real quick. So I'm going to filter out all the normal hours of operation, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 
four, five. <clears throat> I'm going to filter out all those hours, then I'm going to filter out the days of the week that it doesn't run, Sunday and Saturday. In this filtering scheme, one is Sunday, two is Monday, etc. And interestingly enough, when we put those filters on, this cloud didn't go away. This cloud did. Sort of suggested, you know, that the, the chiller thing really was, <clears throat> you know, what was driving the consumption up there. But this cloud didn't go away, which suggests that there's equipment that's supposed to be scheduled that isn't running. So we decided we wanted to understand that better. Um, which is pretty easy to do, but we also thought, wow, it'd be nice to quantify that. And that's actually really fast with this data set and with these filters. I'm going to re, I'm going to um, <coughs> show you how to do that. I'm going to keep the filter in there, actually. Um, now I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to unfilter it, and then we'll put it back after I show you these uh, techniques. Um, Select all, missed there. Okay. I said it was easy to do um, because one of the things, these yellow highlighted columns, this is the data that Jay and Brian actually got from the utility. In other words, the utility records basically had a year, a month, a date, a start and end time, and the consumption for that interval. Okay. And so if you go to the bottom of this column and just total it up, Oh, and I already have the formula in there, I guess. Um, and total it up. That's the total consumption for the period of time represented by this data set. Now, I could, one way to total it up, I'm going to clear this formula out. One way to total it up is to just use, you know, the sum formula. So basic, get down there to that bottom cell. And so, uh, where's kilowatt hours? Right here. So I could say equals sum and that's totaled up and there's a 100,932 100, kilowatt hours for the period of time that ended April 28th, 2014 and started uh, January 7th, 2014. So, now what would be nice it be able would be to be able to see that over here you know, while I'm looking at this chart. So I'm actually going to add some cells. I'm going to put in uh, total consumption cell. I'm just going to format it like that. I'm just going to point, I'm going to say make this value here basically equal to this total. Okay, Because now as I play with the filters I can watch how the filters change the KWHs. So KWH there so I know the units. And uh, I know I could even say, well, I know the electric rate. And uh, I happen to know for them it's about 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Pretty expensive down there in California. And uh, so let's just paint that format down here. And I'm going to format this be a dollar so currency oops currency to four decimal places because that's usually how you show an electric rate and then so uh, total cost would basically be equal to uh, the 18 cents oops times the consumption and format that to be money. Take out the four decimal places for the total. So now I got this cool little thing as I apply filters it'll you know so for instance if I um, what I'd like to know is like if it's really true that equipment's running when it shouldn't be what would that be worth? And so 
I had it filtered down to where I eliminated this cloud, but I'd like to eliminate the base load from that discussion. Um, so if I added a filter that can just eyeball it, like you can see the break in the cloud is somewhere around 30 kW. So if I, I have a 50 kW filter, and so if I basically make a copy of this column and insert it, so I'm going to copy it, so I highlight it, and I say Control C, or I could have right clicked and copy, and then I'm going to say insert copied cells. So now I have a second copy of that column, but I want to, now if I look at the formula really close, because I inserted it here, over here, it, or I'm sorry, because I inserted it here, it's referencing the wrong cell now. It's referencing the outdoor air column. And so I need to make two adjustments. I want to keep the 50 kilowatt hour filter because I'll use that too. In other words, this filter is basically looking at the KW demand column and basically saying if the value is above 50, put a 1, otherwise let it be a 0. Why don't I make a similar filter for 30? So KW greater than 30. And I want my formula to say if the KW demand, not the outdoor air temperature, is greater than 30, put a 1 in this column. Now I'm just going to copy that to the end of the column. And so now I have a formula and a column that will let me filter out anything above or below 30 kW, depending on whether I pick the zeros and ones. Um, I also added another column that's pretty handy that we'll use, and I'll actually bring this, this over. This column right here, I basically just put hours and I put a, put a one in it. And actually, I, I just realized it's not a one. Basically, each of these readings is 15 minutes, so that should be a 0.25. But the point is that if I just put, oops, if I just put 0.25 in this column, and then total it up, And that's a, these columns over here are part of a pivot table I'm not worried about right now. It just happens to be there. If I basically you know, put in the formula that says equals the sum of that column, basically I build a little thing that will say, here's how many hours are in this data set. Okay? So for instance, for a data set that started in January and ran through the end of April, there's about you know, 2,000 some hours, that's kind of what you'd expect. That's about a quarter of a year and there's 8,760 hours in a year. So I'm also going to point, I'm going to go back up here to my graph. And I'm going to just put a little hours in the sample column in here. Copy that. Format, for Davidism, and uh, just point to that cell. And so these are just convenience things. Um, basically, it's putting a bunch of information up where I can watch it as I play with the filters. And so I want to you know, put that value in that cell right there. Because now, what that gets, what all that manipulation got for me. So let's just go ahead and filter out all the hours below 30. So I got a, that means if there's a zero there, I don't want to keep it. So there, those hours went away and wait a second, this number didn't change. I thought I was totaling up the KWHs. And, and to, truth is, I knew it wouldn't. I want that. I set that up. <clears throat> when you're going to filter stuff, if you just use the sum formula, it adds all 
of the values up in that column, whether they're hidden or not hidden. Because remember, all the filter did was hide the rows that didn't have the data I was interested in, but it didn't eliminate them. So sum basically adds all that up, whether it's visible or not visible. We want a different formula there. There's a thing called auto sum. Um, there's a bunch of ways to do it. I think the actual formula name is subtotal, but if you go to the formulas tab and pick auto sum, pick sum. Now you'll notice I get a different formula. It's called subtotal. It has a nine in front of it, and then it's looking at that same range, but what the nine does, I'm just gonna say enter. Notice now I get a different number. That's the sum of the visible cells. That's a different thing. I'm gonna click in this formula and basically the function number tells you whether you want to do a, a sum. Uh, there's other functions like you can do a min, minimum, you can do a maximum, um, you can do an average. By putting a 9 in there I'm saying I want the formula to subtotal what is in this range. And by its definition, subtotal is only going to add up the things that are visible when you apply a filter. So it's a really handy thing. So what I, I had put the wrong formula in there, and I did that intentionally to, to illustrate this. There's a difference between sum and subtotal when you're starting to play with filters. So I want to make that formula subtotal, not sum. And I want to come over and do the same thing here. And again, if I click this, it'll pretty much do it for me. Um, if I pick more functions, um, I guess I have to click on the help to find out the different function codes. Uh, it's not there, but the point is you can figure out what the function codes are. I'm not going to worry about, you know, doing the research. What I really want to point out is sum, subtotal is different than sum, and the ones you use the most, like count, minimums, maximums, you can do with one click. So if I click on sum, it, fix, it puts in subtotal with the function code 9, which is add, and it picked that range automatically for me. So now now those numbers are actually reflect, reflecting the filtered cells. Okay, so now I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to do one other thing here. Um, I'm going to unfilter it again. And I'm going to I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste the values here. Oops. I didn't paste values, that was the problem. So what I'm doing up here, this is literally now a number and it's basically the number of hours in my sample. I, so I wanted to create a place where I had the number of hours that wouldn't change no matter what I did with a filter, so I could compare them to the number of hours that were left in the filtered set. So hours in the filtered set, total consumption in the filtered set, and the total cost in the filtered set. The reason this is handy is it might let me do some projections. Um, so, so for instance, I might want to add a thing that says percent of the hours in the sample. So that's basically going to be equal to um, let's see here, there's this many hours in the filtered set divided by this many hours in the sample, and it should come up 100% when I format this as a percentage. Actually, I don't need multiple decimal places. The reason that's handy is, say I filtered this for those hours when the equipment shouldn't be running, and it said, well, there's dots there, but it's like half a percent of the time. So maybe I should put one more decimal place. I wouldn't be, that wouldn't be as attention grabbing as I do the filter and it says, you know, 20% of the time you're running something when it shouldn't be. That's a bigger deal. So this is just a reference thing.
So now let's look at how sort of easy it is to figure out what this unnecessary operation might be worth because it really is pretty easy. Basically if I filter out the base load which is this filter I built that said everything basically below 30 I want to get rid of. So if it's above 30 I get a 1 so I want to keep that so I want to get rid of those. Okay so you'll notice now my totals changed and so now I'm looking about half the time and so now if this really was you know if this cloud right here really was the hours that the building was running if I turn off those hours like we did below it before it should go away and it didn't so I'm going to eliminate the days of the week that we know the buildings off Saturday and Sunday And you'll notice that changed things. So that means the fact that I just dropped the KWHs by turning off Saturday and Sunday means something must have been running Saturday and Sunday. So we're starting to hone in on something here. So now let's filter out the hours of the day when the building should be in operation. So if we turn those hours off, if, if the schedule really was working, there'd be no data left. So I'm going to turn off all the hours the buildings scheduled on. So you notice, like before, the higher demand hours went away. We think that was associated with the chiller. But all these hours still, these are hours of the day when the building's supposed to be off, weeks of the day when the building's supposed to be off, and we're showing consumption. That's 15% of the time, and it's 14,000 kilowatt hours. So fixing that problem is basically, this isn't actually dollars per year, I realized. This is dollars per sample, dollars per sample, per data set. So, and if the data set is like about a quarter of a year, there's probably four times that much energy to be saved just by understanding why things are running when they shouldn't be, which is my point. So we could actually even add a little thing to sort of point us at that. We could say hours in the year. There's 8,760 hours in the year. Um, and so the sample relative percent of the you know what part percent of a year in the sample it's basically how many hours were in our sample divided by how many hours were in a year that's a percentage so it's about 30 percent and so the reason that's handy is potential annual savings. If this is a fairly consistent pattern, in other words, if we had a bigger data set and it looked like, and we discovered, wow, that's happening all the time, what that means is this represents 30% of the potential savings. And so if I take basically this number and divide it by uh, this, am I doing that right? Yeah, 30%, yeah. That's the actual potential dollar savings associated with, with it. And if I took the KWH and divided it by this, that's the potential KWH savings there. And so then the question would become, do we or don't we? Oops, capital. There we go. Do we or don't we? Is this a this is this a pattern that only happens from January through April, or do we think this pattern goes throughout the year? Um, one way to figure that out is to get a bigger data set. But if you didn't have a bigger data set, Another way to look at it would might be able might be to say, well, gosh, this is a phenomena that we're saying is some 
relationship to outdoor air temperature. In other words, we're plotting kW as a, pl as a function of outdoor air temperature. Actually, this is kWh. I think I actually plotted the kWh. But let me take a look. Forget which. No, it is kW. Okay, so I, I plotted demand. Okay. So I thought I had the axis mislabeled. But the point is, we're saying this is a function of outdoor air temperature. So maybe if we looked at what the outdoor air temperature was like for this interval relative to what it's like for an entire year for this location, that would give us a clue about, you know, how much we wanted to extrapolate these savings. And one way I like to do that is something I showed in one of the other video clips. I like to go out to the National Weather Service sites and I'll show you how I got to this real quick again. Like if you just basically what you want to do is find the forecast office for the location you're at. And so to basically start start from scratch, I would go to the National Weather Service website and I would type in, this happens to be uh, in Monterey or Pacific Grove, California. So I want to see Pacific Grove, California, and I say go. Hmm. Maybe I didn't... Oh, there we go. Ah, dang it. <laughs> I just didn't wait long enough. Sorry, my internet must be a little slow right now. Um, so let me just, we'll just start this over again. I told you, if I go to this format where I'm going to do the screen captures and not edit it, you're going to see a few bugs, but... So I got too far then. So let's say, let's go back to the National Weather Service, home page, type in Pacific Grove. Okay, and so it basically hooks me up with the Monterey Airport. But what I really was trying to find out, and you can actually see the Monterey Airport from this site, so this wouldn't be bad data. But what I was trying to find out is, what's the forecast office? It's there, and if I go to the forecast office, a lot of times you'll find the nomographs are out on the home page, or if you go to the climate tab, you can find them by picking uh, climate history. But this is what I was looking for. And so then the question is, well, what areas do they have this data for? And they have Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, Salinas. And so if you don't know California, you'd say, well, which one of those is closest and most likely to be like Monterey? Well, I just used Google Maps. If I, and I happen to know it a little bit. So I guessed at Salinas. And sure enough, Salinas is sitting here in the Presidio Monterey and stuff is right here. So while Salinas is inland a little bit from the bay, it's probably more like Monterey than not, um, especially when you say, well, the other options would be San Jose up here, or San Francisco here, or Oakland here. So Salinas is probably <clears throat> a reasonable representation of Monterey. So I'm going to pick Salinas. I'm going to pick a yearly chart. And my point is, basically, if you look at the climate, the normal temperature band is in the low 40s, you know, to 60, maybe mid 70s. OK, so the type of temperatures you typically see most of the year is somewhere from, you know, low to mid 40s and on a really hot day normal day, it might be, you know, 72, 73. They get extreme weather, but most of the time, you know, the dark blue band is going to fall inside the green band most of the time. So then if we go back to our data set, and we basically say, well, gosh, what was the maximum and minimum outdoor air temperature that was associated with this period? So let's
Let's see here. OAT max. <laughs> Doing dyslexic stuff here. OAT maximum. And OAT minimum for the period. So we'll go to the bottom of this column and we'll do that auto sum function, but we'll do it with the max and the min instead of. So I'm going to pick this, but I'm going to pick max. And I'm going to pick min. And so I'm just going to point at those cells. So. here equals and then it's going to be one cell below it so it's M make that a one <clears throat> and so if I uh, basically just copy these format or paste the format down maybe give myself one decimal place since the climate data is reported that Increase F <clears throat> what I discover is that for the sample I'm looking at we actually were seeing the band of temperatures that you typically see. So what that tells me is it's pretty unlikely that this is just an isolated thing associated with this data set. It probably occurs most of the time if it's truly an outdoor air temperature driven phenomena or if this consumption pattern is driven by outdoor air temperature, which that's our assertion. And so I'm fairly comfortable saying, you know, based on this data set, there's probably in the range of you know six to eight thousand dollars a year of savings to be achieved simply by figuring out why is stuff running when it shouldn't and so that's that's the point of my little video here pretty quickly once you've created the scatter chart some filters and do a couple auto sums you can start pulling some pretty hard data out of this in terms of savings potential and it's just kind of counting dots so that's that's what I wanted to illustrate and with that I will stop.